and we're live. Oh, and I'm off center. Okay, so we're going to have to get used to a lot of this, but some of you might know me from Rob Street. Um, my name is Dennis, and uh, today I'm going to be starting a new street. Well, that's it. That's, that's, that's all of it. Um, okay, so I've had this idea for a while. I've really wanted to get into streaming, but I'm pretty terrible at video games, uh, pretty terrible at most things. So what I'm not bad at is teaching. And what I decided to do is jump in here and uh, try to teach. So I recently got hired by Queens College to teach economics, uh, and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. So I decided, why not take that to Twitch, right? So a little bit of background about myself. I work in real estate. Um, I have started three businesses, right? I have um, on trip, entrepreneurship. Um, that's not how you spell it at all, but that's how we're spelling it here. And... Besides that, I've worked in consumer product goods. Uh, I, I've run a small company. I've run a rather large company with close to a million dollars in sales a year. Uh, and I have a real passion for teaching. So that's, those are my credentials. Uh, my goal is to be able to teach full time, whether that's on Twitch, at a university, uh, or whatever it is, kind of my next step is to go ahead and become a full time professor. So from there, I'd like to talk about the goals of this stream. So the reason, sorry, one second. The reason I've decided to go into streaming my lessons rather than like most people do, I think, and, and you know, just record the lecture and put it on YouTube is because of the interaction and questions, right? So I think one of the biggest things that a professor does is they're able to answer questions as they come up in a lecture. Now, I haven't quite figured out the technology for doing that on Twitch. I mean, obviously you guys have Twitch chat, but I will be completely honest with you, I am totally blind. Uh, so until I can get it up on my TV, I'm gonna be stepping in close to kind of read the chat and see what's going on. But this is the big selling point uh, for streaming on Twitch in terms of lessons is that anything I cover is going to have gaps, right? People are gonna have different gaps in knowledge so being able to cover something and immediately answer questions, immediately cover everything else, and even if I do it at the end, it allows for a more full experience. Now, having said that, I will be posting these on YouTube just because I feel like people might miss something or might want to see it again. Um, so that's, that's why we're on Twitch. Now, in the long run, I'd like to be doing this several times a day with different classes. I think there's plenty of topics to cover. So my specialty is in business. Uh, particularly in risk and financial model. Um, now, in order to get there, there's actually quite a bit of material to cover. Uh, so I'm going to try to make it as not dry and as interesting as possible to your day-to-day -day life. So not everybody is trying to become a financial analyst or get on Wall Street for financial modeling. If you are, this will probably be a good introduction course. You'll have to do a lot of the programming and stuff on your own, and I'll try to incorporate that down the line. But right now, my goal is to teach the following topics directly. So one of the topics we're going to start with is, is just understanding the financial system. Um, the reason for that is twofold. One, anything I teach you has to do with the financial system. So if you don't understand what hedge funds do, what banks do, how mortgages work, there's really nothing else that you can do without understanding this. The second reason I'm teaching this is because this is the class I'm currently teaching at Queens College, right? So that saves me a little bit of time in terms of writing my lesson plans, and it allows me to practice both on stream and in the class so that you're getting kind of the best material possible. Okay, so I'm uploading to YouTube. What haven't I covered? Okay, what are we gonna what are we gonna look at? So financial system will be the first kind of major topic, and we'll talk about money, we'll talk about interest rates, we'll talk about different institutions, what they do, where they go, and, and so on and so forth. Um, we'll also cover personal finance, because that's extremely important to every single person, right? 
regardless of whether or not you were born into the richest family in America, or if you're just starting out and you're pulling together paycheck to paycheck, personal finance is going to empower you to make good decisions, um, understand different pitfalls that other people have fallen for that you can avoid, uh, that'll help preserve your money and help preserve your time, hopefully, right? So if you're not wasting the money that you're earning, you're able to preserve your time. Now, uh, a lot of people, and I'll cover this in the class, but a lot of people are generally interested in income independence, right? And this is where, for a minimal amount of work, and sometimes no work, uh, you're able to live off of the income that you receive. So you have a certain amount of money in the bank, and you get interest off of that money, and so on and so forth, and we'll discuss different investments uh, and things that you can do in order to acquire that. Other topics I'll cover are entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. See, now that I have my notebook, I can spell it right. right? I think a lot of people are interested in, in starting their own ventures. Uh, and that includes not only you know, the next Google or software company, that includes small businesses, whether you're trying to open a store or um, you know, open a store or start a little clothing line or whatever it is that you're after. And it includes solo ventures. So solo ventures are going to be a great opportunity. I mean, if you wanted to start streaming on Twitch, if you wanted to go out and become a real estate agent or a salesperson, uh, regardless of what you're doing as a solo venture, you're going to learn things in that class that will allow you to both progress in your career and decide how it is you want to contribute to the world in a way that allows you to have a lifestyle that you enjoy. So that's what we'll cover. I've got a couple more topics I'm going to just go through quickly so that you guys understand that, that you know, this is kind of a, a very long-term project. So, importantly, for the time being, I'm not going to go back on topics, right? Uh, I think there's so much to cover in so much detail. So, for the time being, we'll be doing these lectures pretty regularly. I don't have a schedule yet, okay? So, no schedule yet because this is my first stream and I haven't figured it out. But, I am working to commit daily. So I'm going to be streaming daily for about an hour, sometimes half an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, depending on the material that we're covering. There's obviously no homework. Um, I don't plan on giving homework. I don't know that anybody wants homework. But I will try to provide, and I haven't figured out the technology for this yet, but I will try to provide materials for you guys to work with. So uh, when I'm discussing something, I only have one, one whiteboard in so much time. If you'd like to go and look on your own, I'll provide you with the textbooks I'm using as background. I'll provide you with any handouts and paperwork that I'm using. Um, and if you guys have any ideas for a good way to do that, I've only thought of Google Drive. But if there's a better way, there's a better way. Uh, one of the things I'd like to figure out for the class is how we're going to be covering... Excuse me. How we're going to be covering questions. So it's a bit distracting for me to read the chat the entire time that I'm talking because I'm trying to keep all the topics in my head. Um, so I'd love for a system where certain questions get highlighted or something like that, and then I'm able to just run through them at the end of class or at the beginning of next class to make sure that everybody understands. Uh, so that's another thing that I'm trying to solve. Besides that, we'll talk about investing. Basically, what you do with any excess money that you happen to have, uh, whether it's income you've earned or savings you have or an inheritance, what are you doing with that money? Because as long as it's just in a checking account or under your mattress or in your pocket, it's not earning you any money. It really should be. No matter how minuscule it is, it really should be. Um, we're going to talk about finance. And in that, I mean more on the corporate finance side, on the investment side, on how different companies are structured. Uh, we're going to talk about economics, just so that you understand the macroeconomic environment and also the microeconomic environment uh, that shape your decisions and that decide what you're going to do and not do. We're also going to talk about accounting, because as long as you live in a country, you're going to be paying taxes. So if you're going to be paying taxes, it's very good to understand what accounting methods are used and how you can take advantage of having to pay taxes and minimize your exposure because those, you know, all of those deductions and, and everything else that exists within your tax system um, are there to incentivize good behavior. Hopefully. We're going to talk about business communication. Uh, this includes stuff 
like resume writing, um, professional communication in the workplace, and everything else. We're not going to spend an awful lot of time on this, but um, I would like to spend a little bit of time because I think a lot of people are going out into, into the corporate environment. They're finding jobs. They're looking to communicate. And, and I hope that this class, you know, if we do when we do business communication, I hope that it helps quell some anxiety about entering the workplace, right? Because starting somewhere new is always, is always trouble. Um, we're going to talk about economic history. Uh, this is a topic I'm particularly excited about and probably the one that's going to take the longest to research. So we'll likely be doing this, you know, on a, on a bi-weekly basis when we start um, and running along one of these smaller classes in between. But economic history is extremely important, right? I mean, I think economic decisions decide a lot of our historical events um, and they provide a very good context for what happened in the world. So that's something very interesting and something I look forward to doing. Uh, we'll cover current events rather sporadically, mostly if you guys are interested in a particular event or want to look at analyzing it, um, or if I find something that's extremely interesting or very relevant to what we're doing. Um, and then finally, we'll cover stuff like statistics and econometrics uh, and any of the math that's required for finance. So these are not going to be separate classes. I, I personally, I believe this is... A total waste of time to do as a separate class unless you're a statistics major or an econometrics major. What we're going to do is we're going to learn it in parallel with these other topics as you need to use them. Right? So when we discuss things like time value of money, you'll probably need to use statistics. Uh, when we discuss financial modeling and economics, you'll probably need to use econometrics. Um, and then that's when we'll cover it and that's when we'll go over it. And then finally, I'm going to leave myself open to suggestions. Now, obviously, I don't, I don't know anything about art, I don't know anything about, um, you know, music, so I can't, I can't teach you guys stuff I don't know. But within the realm of business, I've, I've accumulated not only a lot of experience, but a lot of knowledge, right? So within that realm, I'm open to suggestions, right? So whether it's a particular question in your situation or just something that you'd like to learn, I encourage you to ask that question and get it on the board and kind of work through it because one, other people are going to have that question and two, it'll provide a good case study to apply what we're learning. So that's that. Um, obviously over time, I'll be investing in, in making the stream better. I, you know, I want to get a bigger whiteboard out to here, hopefully. Um, you know, I want to, I, I, I want to reorganize the chat and how the screen looks and all of that. So, you know, bear with me for the time being. We are streaming off of Wi-Fi on a MacBook Air, so uh, it can only get better from here is, is the basic idea. Uh, so that's, that's basically my plan for this, um, for this stream, and, and hopefully, hopefully this is something you guys are interested in. So going on from there, I'm going to take just a second to take a look at the chat quickly. Sorry, how is everybody doing? Yes, it is Dennis the Professor on YouTube, uh, and it is Dennis the famous Russian-American New Yorker. Uh, all right, so it looks, like, it looks like everything's been asked. So, yeah, running an Ethernet cable might be a stream enhancement, number one. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, so... I, you know, you guys should send an email to Apple and tell them to put an Ethernet port into their MacBook Airs um, because they haven't. So, you know, if we if we could all email Apple, maybe they'll do it, but probably not because they're, you know, they like to be pretentious about what they do. So, as a quick sample, just of a lesson, and, and you know, I want to I want to keep the time constrained today to about half an hour. So we've got about 15 minutes left, um, but this is a lesson I just did on Thursday. So the basic topic is what is money, right? And, and this is a, we're going to breeze through this super fast, but just so you guys understand what I'm teaching, right? So most of you know what money is. When you look at it, you feel it. I mean, it's in your pocket. You spend it, right? It's on your debit card. You've got it in Bitcoins. However it is that you process money, you, you basically know the answer to this question. So when economists think about it, they actually think about uh, the money supply, right? So they're not concerned with wealth. Right? They're not concerned with, oh, that guy's really rich. Right? That's not it. 
or you know that guy makes a lot of money. Also, not not interested in income, um, and they're not interested in it actually as a currency, right? So, before we go on, let's discuss what makes a good currency, right? So, what makes a good currency? A good currency. Now, a good currency has several features. Um, it's got to be easily standardized. That's important, right? So if all of your coins had no marking on them and looked identical but weighed slightly different amounts, you would never be able to use that money because it just wouldn't make any sense, right? So it's got to be easily standardized. It's got to be widely accepted, right? I mean, I'd be pretty worried if I went to the pizza shop and gave them some dollars and they said, no, you know what? We don't take dollars anymore. We're actually, we're not into that. Because I get paid in dollars, right? So why would I get paid in something that I can't even buy pizza in, right? So it's got to be widely accepted. The third one is it's got to be easily divisible, right? Easily divisible. So, you know, the base 10 system kind of figures that out. Uh, but it's nice that we have pennies because you're able to charge... Think about it this way. What if we started at $100 bills, right? There was nothing less than $100 bills. And I'll be using American currency. I know some of you might be from, from Europe and other countries, other continents, other continents. Um, but I'll be using American currency because that's what I use every day. So it's got to be easily divisible. So if you've got a $100 bill, you can only go to the store and buy like 200 oranges. That's the only thing that you can afford to buy with a hundred dollar bill. Now, nobody needs 200 oranges. So if it's not easily divisible, then your goods aren't easily divisible, right? You want to be able to go to the store and buy a single orange, right? Or a single thing of orange juice. If you had to buy a truckload of orange juice every time you went to the store, why, well, I, I actually don't know what would happen then, but the reality is it, it wouldn't be a very good world because we'd be spending infinite amount of money on refrigerators, right? So. Besides being easily divisible, it needs to be easy to carry. Okay, this is this is one that um, easy to carry. And this is one that I didn't really think about uh, before I went over this topic in the book. But if the currency isn't easy to carry, you're going to have some major issues. Uh, I mean, first off, it's it, I mean it's just difficult, right? If you can't put it in your pocket, if you've got to like carry around a wheelbarrow full of clay tablets to go grocery shopping. It's not going to make transactions very fluid, right? And this is why electronic payments became such a big thing so quickly, right? In terms of even the initial debit cards and credit cards. Um, and why even from cash, we transition to checks. So uh, it must not deteriorate quickly, right? It must not deteriorate. So, you know, if your money started rotting after a week of, of just sitting out in a humid environment, that's not really good. Right, uh, because then you'd be losing money. Um, so it must be, it must not deteriorate. And finally, it must be difficult to counterfeit. Now this is pretty important, right? Because you know, in economies of the past, you had you had ideas such as seashells, um, you know, and then and then I mean, if your currency is seashells, the guy that lives by the beach is just the richest man because he has access to all of the currency. Um, so. You can extend that to counterfeiting. So if you could print euros or dollars or, or whatever you transact with on your home printer, um, we'd have a lot of trouble because there'd be way too much money in the economy and nobody would trust the value of what you're giving them. So that's what makes a good currency. Do I still have time? Yes. Okay, we still have 10 minutes. So just quickly... And thinking about it now, I am going to try to internationalize the class as much as possible. So as much as possible, I'll try to cover things that are either universally applicable or where they are not. I'm going to try to cover them separately. Um, let me jump over and just see what's going on in the chat. Hey, everybody. Okay, looks like the chat's fine without me. Perfect. Um, all right, so... Money also behaves as a store of value, okay? So this is actually really important. When you go to work and you put in a certain amount of hours, you've created value for your company. Well, hopefully you have, or maybe you've just created value for, for Reddit advertising if you're just sitting on Reddit or on YouTube all day or on Twitch 
But the reality is you're getting paid to create value. So when they give you money, it's storing your value. So when you give it up for oranges, you're paying for, for the value someone else has created, right? And, and you, it's important to consider that entire chain of creation. So it's not just planting the oranges, it's planting the oranges, it's shipping them to the store, it's the guy that owns the store and pays the rent, and you know the people that stock the oranges, the people that select them. There's a whole chain of process where value gets added on, and that's where you get prices. Um, Cash, in that sense, has the highest liquidity, right? Which means you don't have to convert cash to anything else, right? The lowest liquidity is real estate, right? You can't get up and take your house with you most of the time unless, unless you live in an RV or a mobile home. Um, yeah, and, and even in that case, you can't really, you know, take your RV or your mobile home or your house and decide that you're going to pay for it, pay with it at a restaurant, right? It needs to be converted to cash. So just about everything needs to be converted to cash. And for that reason, cash has a very unique value in that it's easily transactable and that you can trade it for just about anything out there. Um, finally, the situation where money does not store value is in inflation and hyperinflation. Right? Inflation and hyperinflation. So one of the things you've probably heard about is the fact that during, uh, immediately after World War I in Germany, there was hyperinflation, right? So, I mean, there are famous pictures of people with wheelbarrows trying to go buy bread. Um, there's entire rooms wallpapered in cash. Uh, and a recent story I read is that even factory workers were paid several times per day in order to be able to spend their money before it became worthless, right? So that's a situation of hyperinflation. And the reason is the government is basically creating or printing too much money. So we try to avoid that at all costs. And we'll talk about how it is that we decide how much more money the economy needs. But for now, it's important to understand that that's bad and having too little money is also bad. So we try to strike it somewhere in the middle. Um, finally... Yeah, finally, and the last thing I'm going to cover is the evolution of money, right? So we started out with, one second, we started out with commodity money, right? So commodity money was directly made out of a commodity, right? So it was made out of gold or silver or seashells or beads or whatever people found to be valuable and rare enough to consider currency. Um... From there, we transitioned to paper currency. I mean, the problem with this is pretty obvious, right? One, it's pretty difficult to carry around giant gold coins with you all the time and enough of them to go buy a house. Um, and second, it isn't particularly stable, right? So we switched to paper money. And paper money, for the longest time, represented the commodity. So you could go and take your paper money and trade it for a commodity. Now, that ran into some trouble, and, and we'll cover this more in economic history, but that ran into some trouble because if you happen to go out in your backyard and find a bunch of gold, what, what that would do is devalue everybody's paper money, right? including your own. So your own money would be devalued as well. So generally this was considered unstable. And the fact of the matter was individual governments could lose power and control because a foreign nation found a large store of gold in their country, right? And this is really, really important because this, you know, I mean, governments care about having power and control, right? I mean, regardless of what you think that they're doing for you, this is an important piece for them to keep stable, right? So we moved on to fiat money. And fiat money is only as good as you believe it is. That's, that's the basic premise. Um, now, the, the United States enforces that in a couple ways. One, you know, you generally won't find people accepting other currencies. Two, you're not allowed to turn down any U.S. currency for a purchase. So it doesn't matter if I go to the car dealership and want to spend $75,000, five cents at a time in nickels, they have to take it, right? So your belief in that currency and the stability of that currency is what keeps that currency together. Now... This system has its own instabilities, uh, and we'll talk about in more details what those are, but overall, this system is great for retention of control, 
right? And governments prefer that because in this situation, they're able to control the currency, control monetary policy, um, and most importantly, slow and expand the growth of their economy. Now, they're not always very good at that, um, but, uh, you know, a solution will come along that's better. But for now, this is the one that we found. So from fiat money, we moved on to checks. Right? So checks are a great invention uh, because instead of carrying around $100,000 with you, you just write a check for $100,000. The bank takes the money out of your account, puts it in someone else's, and you're set. Right. So that's back to that ability to carry around a large amount of capital with you. Right. So checks are just a natural progression. Um, and then we moved on to debit cards and credit cards. Right, debit slash credit cards. So one of the things that happens with debit and credit cards is now it's easier to transact. So not only can you carry your $100,000 with you at all time, but you're able to transact with more people more quickly. So rather than writing out checks, you're able to send them payments, right? I mean, this has basically enabled what we're able to do on the internet. Um, because, I mean, if you had to mail a check to Amazon every time you wanted to buy something, there's no way you'd get two-day shipping. Because, I mean, just sending the check would take a couple of days, right? Besides you writing it, it flying out and getting there, them cashing it, putting it in the bank, um, would take a very long time. So debit and credit cards really accelerated, accelerated the rate at which we can spend and transact, right? And we're going to talk about why that's important in a different lesson. But essentially, you should think about the economy like a set of veins and arteries, right? So kind of like your nervous system. Now, I by no means understand biology, um, but I find that this is kind of the best metaphor, right? And financial institutions are like the heart, right? They're the ones pumping the blood through, right? They're, you know, we'll talk about the analogy for lungs and, and which financial institutions represent different organs, but the reality is you want everything to keep moving. Right? Because if it's not moving, you're going to have very serious problems in your economy. Right? So debit cards and credit cards really enable this. Debt is another thing that enables this very well uh, because capital isn't just sitting. And it's the reason that you can get interest for your money. So if you put money into an investment, one of the reasons that the company is willing to pay you interest is because they're able to invest it somewhere else. Right? So the most important thing to understand here is that the allocation of capital is the goal of financial institutions, right? And it's considered to be the most efficient allocation of capital. Now, as we'll learn, efficient doesn't really mean best, right? I mean, if you think about it from just a simple perspective, right, having Kraft Heinz build another factory to manufacture more ketchup doesn't really help the homeless problem and all the other problems that we deal with in this country, right? So it's the most efficient in terms of generating a return, generating financial return, right? Now, there have been institutions more recently that are set up to generate social return. And social return is very important. And for the longest time, social return was the sole purpose of government investment, right? So... I mean, a company has no use to build a bridge unless they can make profit off of the bridge. And realistically, bridges aren't particularly profitable because all they do is get worse, right? So once you've built the bridge, it's great. And then all you have to do is keep maintaining it and keep charging people, right? So we don't want a bunch of different people building seven bridges across the same river. So that's delegated to government. And that's considered a social return. I mean, one of the reasons uh, New York is so, so powerful is because of our public transportation. Right. So people are able to commute from all over the city into Manhattan to work and from Manhattan to all over the city and even neighboring states within an hour or two at a fraction of the cost and time that it would, that it would take to drive or use any other mode of transportation. Um, so the social return and financial return are two separate things and financial institutions are not interested in social return at all. Right? That's just the reality that, that we have to look at, and maybe that will change in the future. But right now, this is the context that we're going to be evaluating investments from. Right Now, if you can get both, that's a huge win-win. Right, And so what happens a lot of time, right, and, and this is maybe in the realm of 
uh, GoFundMe campaigns and stuff like that is, is there are companies that are after social return and financial return at the same time, and they tend to try to find public fi funding, which is similar to what governments do. Because in general, banks are not particularly interested in creating a social return because they just don't have the investment system, right? They just don't have the incentive structure, excuse me, to go and do that. So that's where we're at. Um, and then finally, a more recent emergence is cryptocurrency. Right? So cryptocurrency is pretty interesting. Um, in particular, we'll talk about Bitcoin. Now, I, I, I by no means am an expert on Bitcoin. I'm not. Um, but from the context of this lesson, there's two things that are very important, right? One, Bitcoin is not widely accepted. Not widely accepted, right? It is in certain social circles. It is for, you know, particular illegal goods or whatever you're trying to buy. But the reality is you can't pay your rent, live all day, eat your food, go to the supermarket, all on Bitcoin, right? When you can, that'll, that'll solve a problem of having a big currency. And that's one of the reasons Bitcoin investors were pushing so hard to have it accepted. Right. Now, the reason people don't accept it is because of the price volatility that's happened. And if you've paid attention over the last year, right, Bitcoin was up to some ridiculous amount of money where people were selling kidneys and mortgaging their homes and, you know, doing whatever just to buy more Bitcoin. Um, and price volatility is very bad in terms of, accepting a currency because if I take a Bitcoin today for my work and tomorrow it's worth half of what it was worth yesterday, I've basically done my work for 50% off, right? And that's not something people are generally content to have happen. Um, so it's not widely accepted. And more importantly, although it is easily divisible, easily divisible, Right, so you can go to one one millionth of a Bitcoin and, and one one billionth of a Bitcoin and keep splitting it up. The fact of the matter is, the way the currency was introduced restricts owners, right? So there are people that have huge investments in Bitcoin, right? Huge investments. And so when you have a single person or a single bank or a single investment firm owning 10% of a current currency, and there's a cap, right? So there's a cap to how many Bitcoins are produced, right? There's a cap on how many are produced. And basically, we keep mining them slower and slower until we eventually, or perhaps never, hit the cap. But it's very, very gradual and eventually is restricted. Um, that's going to make it difficult. However, the technology behind Bitcoin, in particular blockchain, and, and I plan on doing a lesson on this, uh, hopefully this week, but in particular blockchain is going to stick around. And not only is it going to stick around, it's going to revolutionize the way we handle accounting, the way we handle ownership, the way we handle things like deeds and real estate. Um, it's going to be absolutely revolutionary. And eventually we will have a spiritual successor to Bitcoin. Now, I, you know, I don't want to speculate on what that's going to look like, but eventually it will happen and we will transfer this because simply this happens to be a better, more stable store of value. However, I will say that governments will fight back, right? Governments will fight back because this isn't really great for a huge source of power that they have, right? So they will fight back through regulation and everything else. So it's going to be a slow and, and kind of steady process, but we will get there. And um, that's it. I will actually, one more thing, one more thing, and then I'll read the chat. And then I'll sign off for the day. But the last thing, and I skipped over this, but it's an interesting little fact, right? So what's often brought up is if we didn't have currency, we'd have a barter economy. Okay. So basically, right, I'm a professor, but I'm also hungry, right? I also would like some food. So I would have to find a bunch of farmers in a barter economy to go and listen to my lecture because they're the ones that can provide me with food. Now, the reality is I'm not going to find many farmers that also want to be very well versed in economics, right? I'm just not. It's, I mean, there's plenty of them out there, but I'm just not going to find them all in my local region, right? So the barter economy would, would leave me starving, and eventually I would also become a farmer, right? So one of the things it doesn't allow for is complexity. Right? Complexity of transactions. 
Now, the reality is we've seen barter economies evolve, um, but most of the examples are actually quite recent, right? So when currencies become particularly unstable, it just makes more sense to trade oranges for apples, for milk, for chickens, um, because complexity falls away as well, right? Uh, destabilized currency doesn't really allow for things like higher institutions of learning to exist and, and other such things. So that's happened recently. Well, hold on one second. I live, I, you know, this is New York. So um, from there, what's actually happened in the past, and this is often referred to as the economy of primitive people, but what's actually happened is the gift and sharing economy, right? Gift and sharing economy. And this just makes more sense, right? So rather than barter, I mean, if you're in a tribe of, you know, 50 people and you happen to go and get some food, if you share your food, next time the food will be shared with you. Um, and there's plenty of examples of that actually happening. And that's a little preview of kind of where we'll start for economic history and the development of currency and how it's toppled kings and kingdoms um, and, and made people extremely wealthy and extremely powerful. Uh, so, you know, the thing to remember is a barter economy is often used as an example, but it's not really all the way there. So, before I sign off and before I go and read the chat for one last time, I'm going to say the following. So, I'm doing this, uh, one, because I love teaching. I absolutely love teaching. This, this is something I completely did not expect. Um, I, I always had a hint of it inside of me that maybe I would like this. But once I got that job as a professor, I, I've absolutely loved it. So, and I'd like to do it as much as possible because I want to get better. Right? So one of the things I'm always going to be asking and always going to be looking for is feedback. And that doesn't just mean stream quality. It means the quality of my teaching, the quality of my speech, anything that you believe would make this better. Um, and finally, and this is something I, I'd like to share with you guys, but my, my purpose as I see it uh, in my lifetime is to make education accessible to everyone. Education accessibility. Right? And that means globally. Right, so I'd like to share a little anecdote, but sometime before public education, most education happened in, in churches and, and other religious institutions, right? And when public education was first proposed, people said, well, it's ridiculous. These poor people can't ever learn to read and write, right? That's, that's, that, it's just impossible, right? And, and the thing is, people really believe that. And if I asked you the question, can everyone become a rocket scientist or a financial engineer, you would probably say, well, you know, maybe it's not for everyone. And that's bullshit. That's complete bullshit. Anyone can learn. Anyone can do anything. And I think the most important thing holding them back is accessibility. So I'm going to do everything within my power, not only to scale this stream up and these lessons up and all the tools, but to try to make everything as accessible, as reachable as possible, and hopefully within my lifetime on a global level. Because I believe that this will make the biggest difference in our species and who we are as humanity. Because I, I think that... People collaborating on, on a level where everyone is not even on the same playing field, but has access to the same kind of learning and the same kind of institutions and the same kind of freedoms in terms of what they know is going to change the dynamic of our conversations drastically. Um, and it hasn't happened yet, but I happen to be born and exist in a time where the technology is already becoming accessible, right? All that's necessary is the legwork to get it out there and get it done. So that's the reason I'm working on this. And you know, I'm Dennis the Professor on YouTube and Twitch. Uh, and I'd like to thank Alpaca Patrol, who's a, a good friend of mine and, and a constant inspiration and, and just a huge help in, in getting all of this started and running. And um, I'd like to thank all of you guys for being here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, and stay tuned for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow I'll be back with another lesson. I'll put something together and thank you. So let me let me jump into the chat. Thank you, Mr. Professor Man. Yep, that's right. All right, awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. No, I'm 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 Rob deserves to have his ego inflated on this one. He really he really has been a huge support. Um Basically, my whole life. That's, I mean, that's why we're best friends. Uh, so, yeah.
I'm going to say thank you to you guys. And um, yeah, I'll see you guys tomorrow for another lesson. So yeah, like, like Bubblegum Viking said there, follow. And um, I'll try to set up Twitter and all that other stuff. But right now, I really want to do this. Oh, so if you guys, I, I don't have Twitter yet. Once I do, I'll, I'll get it up there. And I'm thinking about Discord and all that other stuff. Um, but let me know if you guys have any questions too. So I'm going to, I'm going to switch to where you can't see my face because I feel like me just standing in the camera like this probably isn't great. Um, but if you guys have any questions, I'll be here for about another four or five minutes and I'd be happy to go over them. Thank you again.